Hello and welcome to this continuing first look exploring session, our second session looking at The English Traveller by Thomas Hayward, written somewhere around 1623-24, uh, 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 reasonably precise on the date, and uh, yes, we're, we're, we enjoyed it last time, I think I say, I say we, I wasn't really here last time, I was here, but you didn't, you couldn't see me, I was invisible for most of the time, um, but yeah, uh, generally uh, there was lots of good clown action, there was lots of good stuff for actors to get into, uh, Sarah, who uh, hosted the session for me last time, uh, I think t talked about it being quite tasty, it's quite meaty, quite chunky. Uh, yes, I was get... salivating. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was, there was uh, much much massacring of meat uh, going on last time. So uh, we will continue and see whether the middle section of the play uh, continues with that promise. Uh, so reading today, young Lionel is... Alan, based in Suffolk. Reading old Lionel and Dorora is... Stephen? <laughs> Sorry, miles away. Hello. Well, this is this is um, this is my focused face and my sorry face it's from the <laughs> northwest of England. Uh, reading Re uh, Reynold and Clown is a leaky chapel, also in the northwest of England. Uh, reading uh, Belanda and Delaville is <clears throat> hello, Dan, actor based in Montpellier, France. Reading uh, a scuffer, prudentilla, and usurer is... Lynn Freitas, a uh, mild-mannered uh, teacher of English by day, and uh, I'm in the northwestern United States. Uh, reading uh, wench number one, Wincott, gentleman, and Bess is... Emma Kemp. I'm an actor and I'm in London. Reading uh, Gallant Number One, old and old Geraldine is uh, Lois. I'm not an actor, but I'm in London. Reading Gallant Number Two, Wife, Man, and Ricott is Kyle Di Roberto, uh, educator, and I'm in Tucson, Arizona. And reading Rioter, Servant, and Young Geraldine is. Hello, I'm Sarah Blake, actor, writer and director based in Germany. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I think I've done everyone. Uh, I will be reading stage directions and other exciting things like that. Um, uh, assuming uh, that this is indeed Act 2, Scene 2. Uh, enter young Lionel, uh, a, a rioter, blander, scaffer, two gallants and two wenches as newly waked from sleep. <sighs> We had a stormy night on it. The wine still works. <laughs> and with a little rest they had to tonight, they have scarce come to themselves. Now, tis a calm. Thanks to those gentle sea gods that have brought us to this safe harbour. Can you tell their names? He with the painted staff I heard you call Neptune. The dreadful goddess seas. Upon whose back ne'er stuck March fleas. Uh, one with the bill uh, keeps Neptune's porpoises, mm, so Ovid says in his metamorphosis. A third the learned poets ride on, and as they say, his name is Triton. These are the marine gods, to whom my father in his long voyage prays to. Cannot they that brought us to our haven bury him in their abyss? For if he's safe arrive, I, with these sailors, sirens, and what not, I'm sure here to be shipwrecked. Stand up, stiff. <gasps> but that the ship so totters, I shall fall. If thou fall, I'll fall with thee. Uh, now I sink, <gasps> and as I dive and drown, thus <laughs> by degrees I'll pluck thee to the bottom. They fall. Main for England! See, see, the Spaniard now strikes sail! Enter uh, Reynold. <clears throat> so must you all. Uh, whence is your ship? Uh, from the Bermudas? Worse, I think, from hell. We're all lost. Split, 
Shipwrecked and undone. This 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 place is a mere quicksands. So we feared. Where's my young master? Yeah, man. Speak the news. The news is I uh, and, and and you and uh, what? She and uh, all I. We and all ours are in one turbulent sea of fear, despair, disaster, and mischance swallowed. Your father, sir. Why? What of him? He is... Oh, one breath. Where? Landed. And at hand. Upon what coast? Who saw him? Aye, these eyes. Oh, heaven. What shall I do then? Ask ye me what shall become of you, that I've not yet had time to study him to dispose myself. I say again, I was upon the quay, I saw him land, and this way bend his course. <laughs> what drunkard's this that can outsleep a storm which threatens all our ruins? Wake him! Ho! Rider, awake! <laughs> yes, I am awake! <clears throat> oh, how dry hath this salt water made me a oh, boy! Give me the other glass. Rise, I say. My father's come from sea. Oh, if he become, bid him be gone again. Can you trifle at such a time when your inventions, brains, wits, plots, devices, stratagems and all should be at one action? Each of you that love your safeties, lend your helping hands, women and all, to take this drunkard hence and bestow him elsewhere. I live for heaven's sake. They carry uh, the writer off. Uh, oh, in, rather, so, i.e. I, off stage. But what am I the nearer? <laughs> Were all of these conveyed to sundry places and unseen, the stain of our disorder still remain, the which the house will witness, the old man must find when he enters. And then for these... Enter again. I am here left to answer. What is he gone? But whither? But into thyself. Same house that harbours him, my father's, where we all attend from him surprise all. I will make that prison of your fears your sanctuary. Go, get you in together. To this house? Your father's, with your sweetheart, these and all. Nay, nay, no more words, but do it. I work to betray us to his fury. I have it here to bail you hence at pleasure, and in the interim, I'll make this supposed goal to you as safe from the injured old man's just incensed spleen as were you now together in the Low Countries, Virginia, or the Indies. Present fear bids us to yield unto the faint belief of the least hope at safety. Will you in? But by thee, by we, thee we will be counseled. Shut them fast. And thou and I to leave them? No such thing, for you shall bear your sweetheart company and help to cheer the rest. And so thou meanest to escape alone? Rather without, I'll stand a champion for you all within. Will you be swayed? One thing in any case I must advise, the gates bolted and locked. See that amongst you no living voice be heard, not so much as a dog to howl or, or a cat to mew. All silence. That I charge as if this were a mere forsaken house, and none did there inhabit. Nothing else? Though the old man thunder at the gates, as if he meant to ruin what he had reared, none on their lives to answer. Tis my charge. Remains there nothing else? Only the key, for I must play the jailer for your durance to be the mercury in your release. Me and my hope, I and this key deliver to thy safe trust. And we're just going to pause there because I, uh, for those who weren't here last time, I'm wondering what all this sea stuff's going on. Um, uh, on the one hand, yes, there are some filthy things probably being intimated in the dialogue at the very beginning of the scene. Um, and also, it's all quite fairly lit. They had one hell of a party. It was a boat boat themed cosplay. Um, uh, 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 LARPing experience of, of fun and uh, it was described in great great detail last time um so it seems that this is the aftermath basically of that uh that seems to be what's going on i think i could be wrong on this point i will go around the room alan then leaky yeah it's one of those mornings when the alka seltzer's too noisy Mm. <laughs> yeah, and well, literally, the, the the way that we sort of got Dormouse at one point, or the rioter just going, I'm awake, I'm awake, I, I wasn't asleep. Uh, <laughs> a leaky. 
It's like one of those American movies from the 80s in suburbia and the parents are away and the boy has had a great big huge drunken frat party all over the house and yeah. Yeah, the yeah parents we've are... totally seen this before. <laughs> That, that's what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Because, of course, yes, that's the news that R- Reynold brings is, Dad's home! <laughs> <laughs> and so they come up with this cunning plan that seems to be about uh, throwing themselves in jail. Um, I, 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 I didn't quite understand how the mechanics of that one. Have they just walked past the local lockup and they're just chucking people in there? No, I uh, think he's, they've, they've gone into the house. He's right. made the house their jail. Right. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay and I don't know why the house couldn't just be the house anyway uh well, no because uh, 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 i've 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 highlighted this uh this upcoming speech so i know what i'm talking about <laughs> he has a cunning plan let yeah. it unfold <laughs> uh, yes uh yes he did intimate there was a cunning plan and i look forward to finding out what the cunning plan is um Okay, that was just to primarily just to explicate, make sure everyone's on the same speed. Any initial brief thoughts to throw in before we continue reading the scene, Sarah? I just love the different stages of drunkenness and aftermath that he's caught in this scene. Because, you know, some people are clearly already hung over and suffering. But there's always that one person the morning after who's still so drunk from the night before. Um (laughs) <laughs> but they're still like you know they're still there everyone else is like no quiet shh alka seltzer and there's always one who's just still there and that is right at the beginning of the scene because he's still like on the ship you know and then he then he finally kills over and falls asleep but um that that's just like that's just that, that beautiful little observation that you I, I mean yeah not not every writer would think about that about the fact that there are different stages of drunkenness um you know and people come in and out of it at different times and there's always one person who's behind everyone else so i just think that's a really like a testament to hayward's observation skills of humanity and i'm definitely thinking for a modern production that you know maybe some of them have been on slightly different recreational drugs so you know he's there with the whistle and still going in the corner um and uh yeah bopping away uh stephen muted at present Uh, yeah, I'm just, it just made me think of, of telling and showing, you know, that we don't get shown the party because it's it's far funnier to describe it. And what we get shown is is the dramatic thing rather than, the, as it were, the party piece. So I just thought it, it was an interesting, uh, you know, we had, what, 12 lines or something, you know, a really, really small narration by a straight man, as it were. And that was far funnier than, you know, five minutes of people bumping into things and throwing up would have been. Mm. Yes, it's that that thing in Abigail's party, you know, the, the 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 various odd things are clearly happening, but they're never fully explicated, and it's therefore much more interesting. Uh, Lois, yeah, the exception, I guess, is these two people falling down. I mean, they they're I, either they're falling down because they're drunk, or one is falling on top of the other, and something is going on. Mm. But it's it's that aftermath. So oh, it's, yeah, it's not depicting it. the party; it's do, it's do, yeah. depicting the, the it, it's it's have it's really picking its targets really nicely in yeah. terms of comedy business mm-hmm. uh, and again it's giving actors something to do it's uh, that thing that this is what this play does do very well is it's giving us all options of what mm-hmm. what you could play around with okay let's find out what the cunning plan is shall we uh so um pretty much uh, uh Reynold is left alone probably there might be some additional business going on here we don't have full uh, stage directions uh, uh Leaky, take it away you are fast you are safe and with this turn, it is done. What fools are these to trust their ruined fortunes to his hands that have betrayed his own? And make themselves prisoner to one deserves to lie for all as being cause of all. And yet something prompts me. I'll stand it at all dangers. And to recompense the many wrongs unto the young man done, now if I can doubly delude the old, my brain about it then. All's hushed within, the noise that shall be I must make without, and he that part for gain and part for wit so far hath travelled, strive to fool at home, which to effect art must with knavery join and smooth dissembling meet with impudence, I'll do my best. I swear it prove my praise or shame, tis but a servant's love. 
Enter old Lionel, like a civil merchant, with waterman and two servants with burdens and caskets. Discharge these honest sailors that have brought our chests ashore. Pray them have a care, those merchandise be safe, we left aboard, as heaven hath blessed us with a fortunate voyage in which we bring home riches with our healths. So let us not prove niggards in our store. See them paid well, and to their full content. I shall, sir. Then uh, return. These special things, and of most value, will not trust at board. He thinks they're not safe till they see home and their repose, where we will rest ourselves, and bid farewell to travel. For I vow after this hour no more to trust the seas and throw me to such danger. I could wish you had took your leave of the land, too. Now, it much rejoices me to think what a most sudden welcome I shall bring both to my friends and to my private family. Oh, but how much more welcome had he been that brought certain tidings of thy death? Yeah, it's soft. What's it? My own gates shut upon me? Bar their master entrance? Yet who's within there? Huh? No man speak? Are all asleep or dead? Knocks aloud. No soul stirs to open? What madman is that who, weary of his life, dares once lay hand on these accursed gates? Who's that? But my servant, Reynold? My old master, most glad I am to see you. Are you well, sir? Well, thou seest I am. But are you sure you are? Feel you no change about you? I pray you stand off. What strange and unexpected greetings this? Does a man may knock at his own gates, beat with his hands and feet, and call thus loud, and no man give him entrance? Said you, sir. Did your hand touch that hammer? By whose else? Are you sure you touched it? How else I pretty could I have made this noise? You touched it, then. <laughs> I tell thee, yet I did. Oh, for the love I bear you, oh, me most miserable. You, for your own sake, of all alive, most wretched. Did you touch it? Say I did. Oh, you have then a sin committed. No sacrifice can expiate the dead. Yet I hope you did not. It is past hope the deed is done, that I repent it not. <gasps> you and all yours will do it. In this one rashness you have undone us all. Pray be not desperate, but first thank heaven that you have escaped thus well. Come from the gate. Yet further, further yet. Tempt your fate no more. Command your servants, give off, and come no nearer. They are ignorant and do not know the danger. Therefore, pity that they should perish in. Tis full seven months since any of your house durst once set foot o'er that threshold. Ready, speak the cause. First look about. Beware that no man here. Command these to remove. Be gone. And exit servants. Now, speak. Oh, sir, this house is grown prodigious, fatal, disastrous to you and yours. What is it, fatal? What is disastrous? Some host that hath been owner of this house, in it his guest hath slain. We suspect it was he of whom you bought it. How came this discovered to you first? I'll tell you, sir, but... Further from the gate? Your son one night supped late abroad, I within. Oh, that night I shall never forget. Being safe got home, I saw him in his chamber laid to rest, and after went to mine, and being drowsy, forgot by chance to put the candle out. Being dead asleep, your son affrighted, called so loud that soon I wakened, brought in light, and found him almost drowned in fearful sweat. Amazed to see it, I did demand the cause who told me that this murdered ghost appeared. 
his body gashed and all over, stuck with wounds, and, and spake to him as follows. Proceed, tis that I long to hear. I am, quoth he, a transmarine by birth, who came well stored with gold and jewels to this fatal house, where seeking safety I encountered death. The covetous merchant, landlord of this rent, to whom I gave my life and wealth in charge, freely to enjoy the one robbed me of both. Here was my body buried, here my ghost must ever walk, till that have Christian right, till when my habitation must be here. Then fly, young man, remove thy family and seek some safer dwelling, for my death this mansion is accursed. Tis my possession bought at the dear rate of my life and blood. Not enter here that aims at his own good. And with his charge, he vanished. Oh, my fear! Whither wilt thou transport me? I entreat, keep further from the gate, and fly. Fly whither? Why dost thou not fly too? Uh, what need I fear? The ghost and I are friends. Reynold? Tush! Nothing have deserved, nor aught transgressed. I, I came not near the gate. To whom was that thou speakest? Was your you, sir, named me? Now, as I live, I thought the dead man called to inquire for him that thundered at the gate, which he so dearly paid for. Are you mad to stand a foreseen danger? What shall I do? Cover your head and fly, lest, looking back, you spy your own confusion. Why dost thou not fly too? I tell you, sir, the ghost and I are friends. Why didst thou quake, then? In fear, lest some mischance may fall on you that have the dead offended. For my part, the ghost and I are friends. Why fly you not, since you are not safe? Some blessed powers guard me. Nay, sir, I'll not forsake you. I have got the start, but ere the gold, to ask both brain and art. Exuant. Um, uh, we haven't had such an enjoyable gambit uh, of, of this line since the bugbears, I think, isn't it? <laughs> um, a slightly different setup to this, but um, uh, yeah, uh, pretend ghost uh, while they're phoning up looking for french polishers um it's uh it's it's that sort of uh, uh and, and desperately cleaning cleaning up sorry that's a reference to a very old advert um so <laughs> lynn yeah i was just looking at, at this on the page and not not reading i'm just like oh this is kind of a long exchange mm. um and, and, you know maybe we're gonna end up having to cut this but it, it was pretty hilarious <laughs> Yes. I was, yeah, it was very entertaining, and 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 but Aliki just ran with it in a, in a really wonderful way, I think. And um, yeah, I thought, oh, he's gonna tell the the old guy it's a plague house, uh, shades of uh, uh, the woman's prize. Um, but no, it's like it's haunted, <laughs> and the old guy just buys it, like, oh, a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and what I particularly like about it is, that, is you know, well, why aren't you, why are you still here then? He's like, oh, we're, we're friends, friends. We're, 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 we're fine, you know, and it's sort of like he's sort of poking holes like in the me. argument. <laughs> yeah, we're buds. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the one thing that struck me a bit weird, the, the way that that scene worked almost felt more like the way the clown was behaving in the first couple of scenes. Um, and yet suddenly we got Reynold, who's who's given a a very similar type of shtick to what the clown was getting up to. Mm. Um, whether that's a succession issue of, you know, this is we're going to try out the next comic in the in the company. Well, I don't know if they're doubleable or not. Uh, they are this session. Uh, Lois, then Stephen, and then Sarah. Well, Reynold has the role really of the cleverest slave in Plautus. I mean, mm. it's uh, 
uh, and that, that's what he corresponds to. I mean, you know, as I mentioned last time, this is based on a, a plot as comedy, which I think is usually translated as the haunted house. Mm. Uh, yes, which uh, uh, which which is uh, again that 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 forerunner to the bugbears I mentioned earlier as well. Mm. Um, so it's all it's all it's all got a there's a lovely dynasty mm. to it all. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I mean, it also reminds me of of, of the parasite figure um, in Volpone, perhaps, mm. which I guess is probably classical too. Um, mm. And also a bit of the vice, that kind of thing, you know, really taking the audience into into the confidence. And it's a kind of, you know, that, that sort of thing where what we're about to watch, we've been prepped for it. We've been told it's going to be fun, but it's also quite morally dubious. So there's a, there's a very tangled kind of set of things going on really um and, and the other thing is we you know we don't know for certain you know we get hung up on the idea that there's one clown one mm -hmm. kind of comic actor um but you know we, we know of at least one company where there was there was quite a lot of them you mm -hmm. know so um so it, it you know and a lot of plays are clearly you know it's not just the one funny actor and, and or or the one tragic actor you know Mm, yes, and actors are versatile. You know, uh, they, 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 you know, they may not be as good as the the major clown, but I bet most, you know, can do funny. Um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are some actors that just can't do funny at all. I mean, there, there are some tragic actors who you know, tried comedy, no, never again. Um, uh, Sarah. Um, no, everything I was going to say has been covered by Lois and. Stephen. I'll go back to Stephen then. But uh, uh, just to kind of uh, greatly enjoyed that that delay of the actual plot emerging mm -hmm. with the whole shtick about touching the door knocker, <laughs> you know, which is which is just kind of it's never explained, is it? It's just delightful sort of throwaway thing. But it also, you know, it's it's time for Reynolds to think maybe we've got some great comic business potentially. But whether there is comic business or not, it just kind of strings it out. And, it, you know, it, ha it has to just have that kind of build, which Leaky did so well, you know, that the whole thing kind of, you know, it curves upwards to this kind of point. Mm. And, and, you know, there's, there's details because, of course, there's lots of servants who are around at the beginning of, the, you know, the entrance of Old Lionel. And, of course, you know, very important to get rid of other people because uh, one of them might not believe the story being told. It's very important to separate the mark from uh, from any outside uh, influence who might poke a, a hole in the con. Um, so this particular Coney has been well and truly trapped and is presumably off to a hotel. Um, so while I say everyone cleans up, uh, let's go into Act 3. Uh, Act 3, Scene 1. Lots of people on in this one. Enter Old Master Geraldine, Young Geraldine, Old Master Wincott and Wife, Dallaville and Prudentilla. <coughs> We are bound to you, kind Master Geraldine, for this great entertainment. Troth, your cost hath much exceeded common neighbourhood. You have feasted us like princes. Uh, this and more many degrees can never countervail the often frequent welcomes given my son. You've took him from me quite and have, I think, adopted him into your family. He stays with me so seldom. And in this, by trusting him to me, of whom yourself may have both use and pleasure, you are as kind as moneyed men that might make benefit of what they are possessed, yet to their friends in need will lend it gratis. And like such, as are indebted more than can pay, we more and more confess ourselves engaged to you for your forbearance. Yet you see, like debtors, such as would not break their day, the treasure late received, we tender back, the which the longer you can spare, you still the more shall bind us to you. Oh, most kind ladies, worthy you are to borrow, that return the principal with such large use of thanks. What strange facility these rich men take to talk of borrowing, lending, and of use, the uh, usurer's language right? You have. Master Geraldine, fair walks and gardens. I appraise them both to my wife and sister. Ah, you would see them. Uh, there's no pleasure that the house can yield that can be debarred from you. 
uh, prithee, son, be thou the usher to those mounts and prospects may one day call thee master. Sir, I shall please you to walk. What, Master Delaville, will you not bear us company? It's not fit that we should leave our noble <clears throat> alone. Be you my friend's charge, and this old man mine. Well, be it at your pleasure. And exuant various people leaving alone uh, Delaville and old Geraldine. You to your prospects, but there's project here. That's of another nature. Worthy <sighs> sir, I cannot but approve your happiness to be the father of so brave a son, so every way accomplished and made up, in which my voice is least. For I, alas, bear but a mean part in the common choir, when with much louder accents of his praise, so all the world reports him. Uh, thank my stars they've lent me one who, as he always was and is my present joy. If their aspect be no way to our goods malevolent, may be my future comfort. Yet, yeah, uh, must I hold him happy above others as one that solely to himself enjoys what many others aim at, but in vain? Uh, how mean you that? Uh, so beautiful a mistress. A mistress, said you? Yes, sir, or a friend, whether you please to style her. A mistress, a friend, uh, pray be more open language. And indeed, who can blame him to absent himself from home and make his father's house but a, as a grange for a, a beauty so attractive? Or blame her, hugging so weak an old man in her arms to make a new choice of an equal youth, being in him so perfect? Yet in truth, I think they both are honest. You have, sir, possessed me with such strange fancies. For my part, how can I love the person of your son and not his reputation? His repair so often to the house is voiced by all and frequent in the mouths of the whole country. Some equally addicted praise his happiness, but others, more censorious and austere, blame and reprove a course so dissolute each one in general pity the good man as one unfriendly dealt with. Yet in my conscience, I think them truly honest. Mm, Tis suspicious. True, sir, at best. But what when scandalous tongues will make the worst? And what good in itself, sully and stain by fabulous misreport? For let men live as chary as they can. Their lives are often questioned. Then no wonder. If such as give occasion of suspicion be subject to the scandal, what I speak is as a noble friend unto your son. Therefore, as I glory in his fame, I suffer in his wrong. For as I live, I think they both are honest. Howsoever, I wish them so. Some course might be devised to stop this clamor ere it grow to rank, lest that which yet but inconvenience seems may turn to greater mischief. This I speak in zeal to both, in sovereign care of him as of a friend and tender of her honor as one to whom I hope to be allied by marriage with her sister. I much thank you, for you have clearly given me light of that till now I never dreamt on. Tis my love, therefore I entreat you, make not me to be the first reporter. <laughs> you have done the office of a noble gentleman and shall not be so injured. Uh, again, uh, enter again as from walking, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Wincott, wife, young General Dean, Prudentilla, etc., to the scene. See, Master Geraldine, how bold we are, especially these ladies. Play a little better than the thieves with you, for they have robbed your garden. You might, sir, better have termed it sauciness than theft. You see, we blush not what we took in private to wear in public view. Besides, these cannot be missed out of so many. In full fields, the, glean the gleanings are allowed. Oh, these and the rest, fair are ladies, at your service. Now to horse. Uh, but one thing, ere we part, I must entreat, in which my wife will be joint suitor with me, my sister too. Uh, in what, I pray? That he which brought us hither may but bring us home your much respected son. How oh, men are born to woo their own disasters. But to see us from hence, he brought us, sir, that's all. The second motion makes it palpable to note a woman's 
cunning, make her husband bored to her own lascivious appetite and to solicit his own shame. Nay, sir, when all of us join in so small a suit, it were some injury to be denied. And work her sister too. What will not women to accomplish their own ends? But this disease I'll seek to physic ere it grow too far. Uh, I'm most sorry to be urged, sweet friends, uh, in what at this time I can no ways grant. Uh, most that these ladies should be aught denied to whom I owe all service. But occasions of weighty and important consequence, such as concern the best of my estate, call him aside. Uh, excuse us both this once. Uh, presume this business is no sooner over, but he's at his own freedom. Were no manners in us to urge it further, we will leave you. With promise, sir, that he shall, in my will, not be the last remembered. Ah, uh, we are bound to you. See them to horse and instantly return. Uh, we have employments for you. Sir, I shall. Remember your last promise. <laughs> not to do it, I should forget myself. Uh, we don't have a proper stage direction, but various people exit. If I find him false to such a friend, be sure he forfeits me, in which, to be more punctually resolved, I have a project how to sift his foul, how tis inclined, whether to yonder place, that clear, bright palace, or black dungeon. See, they are onward on the way, and he returned. Yes, we effectively have a stage direction in the dialogue. We'll just briefly pause there to take in uh, Delaville. Um, uh, there's some... Um, uh, ooh, he's a bit sneaky, isn't he? Mm. He's a bit sneaky. Did, did, did anyone feel he was that sneaky last time? Did anyone detect sneak? Did the sneak detectors go off, anyone? Uh, I'll go to Lois and Sarah. No, the only thing is his name, actually. Uh, I mean, it could... It's vaguely an anagram of devil. It could also be de la vile, uh, evil. You know, there are various things like that. When you see a name like that, you get a bit uh, dubious. Mm. Yes. Uh, ro yes. H hello, I'm Rogi McShifty um, <laughs> of McShifty. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, anyway, uh, Sarah. Yes, I think it was Eric yesterday who was saying, oh, it's like Deville. It's like Cruella Deville. But I have to say, in spite of the name, I did not see this coming because, yeah, um, he, he was set up as quite a, a, a bit of a fanboy yesterday. Um, and plus, there's this thing going on um, with the wife's sister, which was quite a neat little red herring. Um, and I'm just trying to work out what his motivation is, because as far as i'm aware the i don't know how, we don't know how much time has passed of course time time might have passed but um the the vows that the wife and young geraldine took to each other were kind of very secret vows i think they actually <clears throat> said that they were <throat> keeping them secret so if he doesn't know about this then he's if he's from his perspective concocting this out of nothing He's got to have some very, very good reason for doing it. And I can't quite work out what it is because it's not going to, it's not going to further his cause with the sister to, to create this much strife in the family. I wouldn't have thought. So I'm just wondering what is, yeah, I don't know what his motive is. Mm, who knows? Uh, Lynn. I think it's actually possible that the Delaville's motives are not entirely nefarious, that they are at least mixed and maybe exactly what he says they are. Um, or at least I think we're supposed to be um, unsure about that. I mean, he does say the neighbors are gossiping. Your your son's reputation is at stake. What the neighbors say about you matters in mm. this period. Um, uh, and it certainly matters for um, the young wife's uh, reputation and her ability to navigate society. If people think she's cheating on her husband, that's not good. Um, so maybe he really just wants to keep everything on the up and up because he is interested in this young woman's sister. Uh, but the plot thickens, speaking of that, because Prudentila says, oh yeah, let him come with us. So she evidently still 
is hot for young Geraldine, her sister's old boyfriend, um, and not really that interested in, in Delaville. So we have this sort of soap opera going. Uh, so I, I don't know, we might be being a little hard on Delaville. He, he might actually be to a certain degree telling the truth. It's for his own good. We need to keep these two people apart. Yeah, uh, you know, have you ever been in this situation where, you know, you may know something that, you know, about somebody else's relationship? Do you tell? Do you not tell? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. from the outside, it does look very dodgy because, you know, he, he keeps going around and visit, you know, and they seem very close. So, yeah, from maybe it's a perfectly legitimate thing. Uh, a leaky then Lois. So I think it's possible that he's... Um... Let me put it this way. What occurs to me is that in this scene, the first, the only line he spoke, other than that, those lines about um, young Geraldine and the, the unnamed wife, uh, was, oh, look at those rich men, how easily they talk about money. So I'm going to say that there's something about money going on. And maybe the point is to get rid of Gerald, young Geraldine so that he can marry the sister, because if she's not around, then I don't know. But I, I, I think he is somehow financially motivated. Ooh, uh, Lois? I think that there's a really obvious warning sign, um, and uh, I will be very careful with this, but people will uh, undoubtedly remember the changeling in which people of, often refer to honest de Flores, who is anything <laughs> but. And I think that the fact that the word honest comes up several times in this would be uh, a bit of a warning sign. Yeah, yeah people saying you're a sterling chap uh that of often maybe uh, i uh, yeah maybe maybe we shall see i'm staying very tight-lipped at the moment okay so uh young geraldine has returned they've escorted everybody off horses have been <laughs> got and so young geraldine and old geraldine have a chat i now attend your pleasure <sighs> you are grown perfect man and now you float like to a well-built vessel between two currents, virtue and vice. Take this, you steer to harbor, take that to eminent shipwreck. Pray your meaning? <sighs> what father's cares are, you shall never know till you yourself have children. Now, my study is how to make you such that you in them may have a feeling of my love to you. Uh, pray, sir, expound yourself. Uh, for I protest of all the languages I yet have learned, this is to me most foreign. Uh, then I shall. I have lived to see you in your prime of youth and height of fortune, so you will but take occasion by the forehead. Um, to be brief and cut off all superfluous circumstance, all the ambition that I aim at now is but to see you married. Married, sir? And to that purpose, I have found out one whose youth and beauty may not only please a curious eye, but her immediate means able to strengthen a state competent or raise a ruined fortune. Uh, of all which I have, believe me, neither need nor use. My competence best pleasing as it is. And this, my singularity of life, most to my mind contenting. Uh, I suspect, but yet must prove him further. Say to my care, I add a father's charge and couple with my counsel, my command. To that, how can you answer? That I hope my duty and obedience still unblamed did never merit such austerity and from a father never yet displeased. Nay then, to come more near unto the point, either you must resolve for present marriage or forfeit all your interest in my love. Oh, and say that language, I entreat you, sir, and do not so oppress me. Or if needs your heavy imposition stand in force, resolve me by your counsel. With more safety may I infringe a sacred vow to heaven or to oppose me to your strict command, since one of these I must. No, Delaville, I find thy words too true. For marry, sir, I neither may nor can. Yet whore you may, and that's no breach of any vow to heaven. <laughs> Pollute the nuptial bed with mickle sin, asperse the honour of a noble friend, forfeit thy reputation here below, 
and the interest that thy soul might claim above in yon blessed city. These you may and can with untouched conscience. Oh, that I should live to see the hopes that I have stored so long, thus in a moment ruined, and the staff on which my old decrepit age should lean before my face thus broken, on which trusting, I thus abortively before my time fall headlong to my grave. And indeed falls on the earth. It yet stands strong, both to support you unto future life and fairer comfort. Never, never, son, for till thou canst acquit thyself of scandal and me of my suspicion, here, even here, where I have measured out my length of earth, I shall expire my last. Both these I can. Then rise, sir, I entreat you. And that innocency which poisoned by the breath of calumny cast you thus low, shall these few stains wiped off with better thoughts erect you. Well, say on. There's but one fire from which this smoke may grow, namely the unmatched yoke of youth, and in which, if ever I occasion was of the smallest breach, the greatest implacable mischief adultery can threaten, fall on me. Of you may I be disavowed a son, and unto heaven a servant. For that lady, as she is beauty's mirror, so I hold her for chastity's example. From her tongue never came language that arrived my ear, that ever censorious Cato, lived he now, could misinterpret. Never from her lips came unchaste kiss, or from her constant eye look savouring of the least immodesty. Further... Uh, enough. One only thing remains, which on thy part performed, assures firm credit to these thy protestations. Name it then. Take hence the occasion of this common fame, which hath already spread itself so far to her dishonour and thy prejudice, from this day forward to forbear the house. This do upon my blessing. As I hope it, I will not fail your charge. I am satisfied. They exit. Dun, dun, dun. He can't visit her anymore. Um, and this is a scene that's, it's, it's it, I mean, from the, the, the stage direction we do have here, uh, it, it's, it's clearly giving actors something to do. I mean, you know, that, I do wonder if, the, you know, this is, this is something this actor particularly likes doing, uh, a striking an attitude, um, <laughs> falling to the ground, um, Th that question of how demonstrative acting styles were and how mm. how effects based they were um that 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 might be a thing um i do also love and it's it's a mark of this script it keeps happening is that whenever someone's going on for a bit someone tells them to stop <laughs> <laughs> and i i do wonder actually is that a a a, a movable cue is that basically when old Geraldine thinks <laughs> you've gone on long enough uh, you know he can <laughs> leap in at any point enough <laughs> <laughs> if he, you know, because I, I, I wonder how fixed that 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 cue point is actually. Um, I quite like that, you know. Um, you could just stand there, let, let, you know. You improvise another five lines, mate. I, I'm just going to stand it. Um, you know. So I, I wonder about that sort of sort of thing. But yeah, it's a really effective scene. Again, the scene from the beginning to the end, the scene in itself, and this is something I think Hayward's really, really good at mm. is structuring individual scenes individual acts and then stringing those acts together uh, at his best when he's at his best stringing those acts together even though they're episodic into a satisfying whole when he's at his worst the episode the episodic stuff doesn't string together but i think here it's so tightly dramaturged i mean the the, the it's it's so tightly done um uh yeah very impressed very impressed uh thoughts in the room um aliki and then Sarah. Um... I don't know what it is that gives me this impression about this scene, but I really believe in their affection. And I don't always with quarreling fathers and sons who are always protesting how much they love each other. And I think they do. And I found that quite sweet. Mm. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I didn't find it sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I did really um, enjoy though, was the, was again, the, uh, 
the observational power of Haywood and the psychology that's going on here, because there's very little that can um, discombobulate a, a, an adult person than the sight of their elderly parent throwing themselves on the ground and having a tantrum, effectively. <laughs> and it's like, if, if there was one thing he could do uh, to make his son go, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever you want, I'll, I'll do it. Like, this is just... I, I personally felt it was a bit of a master manipulation, um, but, but that just goes to show it. Dep it depends on how the actors play it, I guess. But um, but but yeah, just so beautifully observed. Um, and yeah, uh, there's the, you could say it's like, oh, this is this is demonstrating, this is demonstrative acting because that was what they did in this particular day. Now I've, you know, I I I have seen. Um, you know this kind of behavior in real life this this kind of manipulation does go on so like i think it's pretty well observed actually uh lynn muted at present yes i mean sarah's right about all of that and i think um it, it can be true at the same time that young geraldine is um i, th I think the play is working very hard to show a, a good person he's a decent type of guy he really wants to do the right thing i'm 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 pretty sure we aren't so sp supposed to see him as super flawed um and smart he's a smart guy he's he's traveled he's acquired all these languages so when his father says okay i believe you that nothing Im Im improper has happened but you need to stay away from there for the sake of your reputation um Young Geraldine doesn't have much to, space, he's got one line to act all of this in, but I think he realizes that his father's got a point. Mm -hmm. Why he's, you know, he's putting himself in the path of temptation. He's compromising his reputation. It really is best if he, if he doesn't actually spend time with the woman he loves, uh, as painful as that is. I think he, I think he sees that that's actually the reasonable course of action. Mm. Uh, and I think what's interesting is uh, that the slight variation in people's responses to these scenes is actually a testament to what this script can potentially be pulled around by actors. And that's always what I like to see is that the potential of interpretation. Um, but you, you know, the facts of the scene don't change, but the interpretation can be shifted in quite radical directions. Um, and that's something I like to see. Uh, we need to move on. We've still got quite a lot of text to get through. Uh, so at three, scene two, enter at one door and usurer and his man at the other, old Lionel with his servant in the midst, Reynold. Which hand shall I turn me? Here's my master hath been to inquire of him that sold the house touching the murder. Here's a usuring rascal of whom we have borrowed money to supply our prodigal expenses. Broke our day and owe him still the principal and the use. Were I to meet them single, I have brain to oppose both and to come off unscarred. But if they do assault me and at once, not Hercules himself could stand those odds. Therefore, I must encounter them by turns and do my master first. Oh, sir, well met. What, Reynold? I but now met with the man of whom I bought yon house. Oh, what uh, did you, sir? Uh, but but uh, did you speak of aught concerning that which I last told you? Yes, I told him all. And I'm cast. But uh, pray <laughs> tell me, sir, did he confess the murder? No such thing. Most stiffly he denies it. Oh, impudent wretch, then serve him with a warrant. Let the officer bring him before a justice. You shall hear what I can say against him. Foot deny it. But uh, I pray you, sir, excuse me. Oh, yonder's one with whom I have some business. Uh, stay you here and but determine what's best course to take and a uh, best course to take and, and note how I will follow it. Be brief then. Now, if I can as well put off my use, ma'am, this day, I shall be master of the field. That should be Lionel's man. The same. I know him. After so many frivolous delays, there's now some hope. He that was wont to shun us and absent himself accosts us freely and with a pleasant countenance. Uh, well met, Reynold. Where's this, what's this money ready? Never could you have come in better time. 
where's your master, young Lionel? It's something troubles me that he should break his day. A, a word in private? Tush, private me, no privates. In a word, speak. Are my monies ready? Not so loud. I will be louder yet. Give me my monies, come. Tender me my monies. We know you have a throat wide as your conscience. You need not news it now. Come, get you home. Home? Yes, home, I say. Return by three o'clock. <laughs> and I will see all cancelled. Tis now past two, and I can stay till three. I'll make that now my business. Other ways, with these loud clamors, I will haunt thee still. Give me my youths. Give me my principal. This burr will still cleave to me. But no means to shake him off. Never was caught till now. Come, come, you are troublesome. Prevent that trouble, and without trifling, pay me down my cash. I will be fooled no longer. So, so, so. I have been still put off from time to time and day to day. These are but cheating tricks, and this is the last minute I'll forbear. I'll forbear thee, or thy master. Once again I say, give me my use, give me my principal. Box of this use that hath and wants so many, and now will confound me. <sighs> Hast thou heard this? Do we have a servant? Sarah, I think, technically, is the servant. <laughs> Such a big part, I know. It's so, it's so, it's, it's, I mean, you know, how could you miss it? Sarah, you're muted. <laughs> Hast thou heard this? <laughs> Sir, yes, sir, and to my grief. <laughs> Come hither, Reynold. Yes, sir. Nay, now I'm gone. What use is this? What would the principle he talks of? Which language he names my son, and thus upbraideth thee? What is it thou you owe this man? A trifle, sir. Pray stop his mouth and paid him. I pay? What? If I say paid him, paid him. What's the sum? A, a, a toy, a main about 500 pounds, uh, and the use 50. Call you that a toy? To what use was it borrowed? At my departure, I left my son sufficient in his charge with surplus to defray a large expense without this need of borrowing. Tis confessed, yet stop his clamorous mouth and only say that you will pay it tomorrow. I pass my word. Sir, if I bid you do it, nay, no, no more words. Say you'll pay tomorrow. Yes, indeed. Tell me how these monies were bestowed. Safe, sir, I warrant you. Well, the sum still safe. The sum still safe. Why do you not then tender it yourselves? Your ear, sir. This sum joined to the rest. Your son hath purchased land and houses. Land, dost thou say? A goodly house and gardens. <laughs> now, joy on him. Whilst his father merchandised abroad, he hath cared to add to his estate at home. You be very not where for houses. Now, Lord, sir, how dull you are. This house possessed with spirits and there no longer stay. Would you have had him, us, and, and all your other family to, to live and lie in the streets? It had not, sir, been for your reputation. Oh, blessing on him. He's grown so thrifty. He's struck three. My money's not yet tendered. Fox upon him. See him discharged, I pray, sir. Yeah, call upon me tomorrow, friend, as early as thou wilt. I'll see thy debt defrayed. It is enough. I have a true man's word. Exit Usura and his man. Now, tell me, Reynold, for thou hast made me proud of my son's thrift. Where? In what country doth this fair house stand? Never in all my time so much to seek, I know not what to answer. 
Wherefore studiest thou? Use men to purchase lands at a dear rate and know not where they lie. <laughs> it's not for that. Uh, oh, I only had forgot his name that sold them to us. Um, let me see. Uh, see. Did call myself to mind? Uh, non plaster. Never know. <laughs> where art thou, brain? Oh, sir, where was my memory? Tis this house. The next adjoins to yours. My neighbour, Ricketts. The same, <laughs> the same, sir. We had uh, Pennyworths in it, and, and I can tell you, I've been offered well since to forsake our bargain. As I live, I much commend your choice. Hey, hey, tis, tis well seated, rough cast without, but bravely lined within. You have met with few such bargains. <laughs> Pretty knock. Call the master or call the servant on let me take free view on it. Puzzle again on puzzle. Uh, one word, sir. The, the, the house is full of women. Uh, no man knows how on this instant they, they may be employed. The, the, the rooms may lie unhandsome and may stand much on their cleanliness and hustle free to, to, to take them unprovided were disgrace. Uh, Twere fit they had some warning. <laughs> now, do you fetch but a warrant from the justice, sir? You, you understand me. Yes, I do. To attach him of suspected murder. I I'll see it, sir. D did he deny it? And in the interim, I will give them notice uh, you are now arrived and log to see your purchase. Counseled well. Meet some uh, half hour hence. This plunge well past, all things fall even to crown my brain at last. And exit. It's the mark of a good farce that things slowly uh, <laughs> spiral out of control as one uh, uh, lie or situation uh, lands on another. Uh, and there's something really nice about this. You know, he's, he's, he's trying to keep control of the situation. This usurer turns up and he ends up buying a house, a fictional <laughs> house, and then he has to get, name the house. And it's th that one, that one over there. That's the house. That was, and that's, you can tell that's just a brain fart. It's the worst possible thing he could have said. So he, if he'd said something in the next town, he might have got away with it. But no, it We're has to be that one right there. <laughs> uh, Lynn. Um, I was actually wondering about this yesterday when Young Lionel asks, how's the money holding out? And Reynolds says, oh, we got plenty of cash. Purse is deep. We haven't reached the bottom yet. And I'm like, I wonder if that's true. I'm, you know, in a comedy, it would be typical for that not to be true. And here we go. Yeah, it's not. And he just lie upon lie, upon, just making it up as he goes along. This is <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. That's and we've still got tough. this murder thing stringing along as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it, 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 you know, we've not really got anything out of yet, but I feel there's yeah. a lot of setup uh, on that one. So, yeah. you know, he there's ghosts in the house, which is convenient because they bought one next door for you to stay in. <laughs> I mean, why didn't he say that last night? Uh, anyway, uh, so <laughs> it's all, yeah, it's going well. It's going well. Uh, any additional briefish thoughts before we move on? Um... Yeah, it just keeps keeps giving us good stuff. Keeps giving us good stuff. Anyway, we will move on. Uh, we have a shortish scene. Um, uh, scene divisions are not wholly uh, clear in the, uh, the the text we have, but uh, we can infer these are different scenes. Act three, scene three. Enter Dalaville and a gentleman. Where shall we dine today? At the ordinary. I see, sir. You are but a stranger here. This barnet is a place of great resort and commonly upon the market days. Here all the country gentlemen appoint a friendly meeting. Some about fairs of consequence and profit, bargain, sale, and to confirm with chapmen. Some for pleasure, to match the horses, wager in their dogs, or try their hawks. Some to no other end, but only meet good company, discourse, dine, drink, and spend the money. Yeah, enter old Geraldine and young Geraldine. That's the market we have to make this day. Tis a commodity that will be easily vented. What, my worthy friend, you are happily encountered. Oh, you are grown strange to one that much respects you. Troth the house hath all this time seemed naked without you. The good old man doth never sit to meet, but next his giving thanks, he speaks of you. There's scarce a bit that he at table tastes that can digest without a Geraldine. 
you are in his mouth so frequent. He and she both wondering what distaste from one or either so suddenly should alienate a guest to them so dearly welcome. Master Dalaville, uh, thus much let me for him apologize. Uh, divers designs have thronged upon us late. Uh, my weakness was not able to support without his help. He hath been much abroad at London or elsewhere. Uh, besides, tis term, and lawyers must be followed, seldom at home and scarcely then at leisure. I am satisfied, and I would they were so too. But I hope, sir, in this restraint, you have not used my name. Not as I live. Y'all noble, who'd have thought to have met with such good company? Y'all it seemed but new alighted. Father and son, ere part, I vow we'll drink a cup of sack together. Physicians say it doth prepare the appetite and stomach against dinner. We old men are apt to take these courtesies. Ah, what say you, friend? I'll but inquire for one at the next inn and instantly return. And exit, uh, we can infer Delaville exits here and that uh, young uh, uh, Geraldine uh, encounters the entering Bess. So enter Bess meeting young Geraldine. Bess, how dost thou, girl? Faith, we may do how we list for you. You are grown so great a stranger. We are more beholding to Master Dalaville. He's a constant guest. And howsoe'er to some, that shall be nameless, his presence may be graceful, yet to others, I could say somewhat. He's a noble fellow, and my choice friend. Come, come, he is what he is, and that the end will prove. And how's all at home? Nay, we'll not part without a glass of wine, and meet so seldom. Boy! Enter drawer. Anon, anon, sir. A pint of claret, quickly. Uh, exit, drawer. Nay, sit down. The news, the news, I pray thee. I'm sure I have been much inquired of. Thy old master and thy young mistress too. Ever your name is in my master's mouth. And sometimes too in hers, when she hath nothing else to think of. Well, well, I could say somewhat. Enter drawer with wine. Here's your wine, sir. Exit drawer. Phil, boy. Here, Bess, this glass to both their healths. Oh, why dost weep, my wench? Nay, nothing, sir. Come, I must know. In truth, I love you, sir, and ever wished you well. You are a gentleman whom always I respected. Know the passages and private whisperings of the secret love betwixt you and my mistress, I dare swear, on your part well intended, but... But what? You bear the name of landlord, but another enjoys the rent. You dote upon the shadow, but another he bears away the substance. Be more plain. You hope to enjoy a virtuous widowhood, but Dalaville, whom you esteem your friend, he keeps the wife in common. You're to blame. And best, you make me angry. He's my friend and she my second self. In all their meetings, I never saw so much as cast of eye once entertained betwixt them. That's their coming. For her, I have been with her at all hours, both late and early, in her bedchamber, and often singly ushered her abroad. Now would she have been any man's alive, she had been mine. You wrong a worthy friend and a chaste mistress. You're not a good girl. Drink but speak better of her. I could chide you, but I'll forbear. What you have rashly spoke shall ever here be buried. I am sorry my freeness should offend you, but yet no, I am her chambermaid. Oh, pray play now the market maid, and prithee bout thy business. Well, I shall that man should be so fooled. Exit Bess. She, a prostitute? Nay, and to him my troth plight, and my friend, as possible it is, that heaven and earth should be in love together, meet and kiss, and so cut off all distance. Oh, what strange frenzy came into this wench's brain, so to surmise. 
Was she so base? Uh, his nobleness is such he would not entertain it for my sake. Or he so bent. His hot and lust-burnt appetite would soon be quenched at the mere contemplation of her most pious and religious life. Oh, the girl was much to blame. Perhaps her mistress has stirred her anger by some word or blow, which she would thus revenge, not apprehending at what a high price honours to be rated. Or else someone that envies her rare virtue might hire her thus to brand it. Or who knows, but the young wench may fix a thought on me, and to divert me from her mistress love may raise this false aspersion. Howsoever, my Enter thoughts, clown with letter. My thoughts on these two columns fixed are. She's good as fresh, and purely chaste as fair. Oh, sir, you are the needle, and if the whole county of Middlesex had been turned into a mere bottle of hay, I had been enjoined to have found you out, nor never more returned back to my old master. There's a letter, sir. I know the hand that superscribed it well. Uh, stay, but till I peruse it, and from me thou shalt return an answer. I shall, sir. This is market day, and here are acquaintance commonly meet, and whom I have encountered my gossip, pint pot, and brimful. They I mean to drink with you before I part, and how doth all your worshipful kindred, your sister, court your pater pottle, who was ever a gentleman's fellow, and your old grandsire gallon, they cannot choose but to be all in health, since so many healths have been drunk out of them. I could wish them all here and in no worse state than I see you are at this present. Howsoever, gossip, since I have met you hand to hand, I'll make bold to drink to you. Either you must pledge me or get one other to do it for you. Do you open your mouth towards me? <laughs> well, I know what you would say. Here, Roger, to your master and mistress and all our good friends at home. For mercy, gossip, if I should not pledge thee, I were worthy to be turned out to grass and stand no more at livery. And now, in requital of this courtesy, I'll begin one health to you and all your society in the cellar, to Peter Pipe, to Harry Hogshead, Bartholomew Butt, and little Master Randall Rutlet, to Timothy Taster, and all your other great and small friends. He writes me here that at my discontinuance he's much grieved. Desiring me, as I have ever tendered, or him or his, to give him satisfaction, touching my discontent, and that in person, by any private meeting. Well, I, sir, it is, it is very true. The letter speaks no more than he wished me to tell you by word of mouth. Thou art then of his counsel? His privy, and please you. Oh, though ne'er so strict hath been my father's charge, a little I'll dispense with it for his love. Commend me to thy master, tell him from me on Monday night, then will my leisure serve. I will, by heaven's assistance, visit him. On Monday, sir, that's, uh, as I remember the day, just before Tuesday. Uh, but twill be midnight first, at which late hour, please him to let the garden door stand ope. At that I'll enter, but conditionally, that neither wife, friend, servant, nor third soul, save him and thee, to whom he trusts this message, know of my coming in or passing out when tell him i will fully satisfy him concerning my forced absence i am something oblivious your message would be the truly delivered if it were set down in black and white i'll call for pen and ink and instantly dispatch it they exit i i like an honest clown going i'm not going to remember the letter write it down mate just, just i'm not going to remember any of that that was complicated that was complicated and lots of really nice uh just structural things again the clown is left to do some filler while he reads the letter and i like the sort of realism of that he's got to have time to read the letter and i do wonder again is there a sort of open-ended cue point does uh, basically the clown just keep going until uh he steps in um and and, and all of that stuff um uh, there's there's some really nice little uh, businesses uh, business in this scene. Uh, uh, the, it, it's interesting mirroring of the earlier scene of someone telling something to somebody that they might not want to hear. Um, and the question of how true what they're telling somebody is uh, or isn't. And the, here we have this scene 
best telling young Geraldine that uh, his, his, his love uh, is seen his best mate. Now, does that change what we thought about some of the actions by people made earlier in the play? Because we were asking questions about why was he doing this at this point? Maybe we have an answer. I'll go to Lynn, then we'll go to Sarah. Yeah, I was like, well, that explains a lot. Mm. That that uh, Delaville's pursuit of Prudentilla is a is a is a, a, a ruse. It's a smokescreen so that he can be near the her sister, uh, and he's trying to get his friend out of the way, not to preserve his friend's reputation, but so that he can pursue the. Uh, um, the wife himself. I wish she had a name. It would be easier to talk about her. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how, what Bess has seen and what, you know, what she says is vague enough that I think we can believe that um, Delville is pursuing her but has not yet succeeded uh, in his in his wooing. But, yeah, that, ex that explains Delville's motivation, which seemed really quite opaque earlier so but oh and then like, i i need to talk to your boss alone to to tell him and he may actually be planning on telling um wincott the truth my dad doesn't want me at your house because people are gossiping about me and your wife so i i need to to cheese it for a while but like well you, you better write it down for me oh okay i'll do that oh 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 don't do that mm. It's interesting because it opens questions also about uh, what uh, Mistress Wincott is uh, is up to herself in terms of asking uh, young Geraldine to to wait for her, as it were. Yeah. Um, so there's all sorts of interesting yeah. questions about motivations yeah. that this opens up. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we're going to be able to fully untangle motivations until we finish the play. And yeah. then there may be a question of whether all the motivations actually fully fit together. Because um, with this kind of twisty, turny uh, plot um uh it, it it's uh it's it's yeah it gets complicated sarah then lois then stephen yeah it's very twisty turny um which i'm enjoying immensely and that thing of people's motivations yeah i'm i'm not entirely sure what's going on here which um is is you know it's great because um Young Geraldine has this line as well. For her, I have been with her at all hours, both late and early, in her bedchamber. Um, and but then he goes on about how chaste she is because I, it, it was my understanding that they were they that these pet this pair were like genuinely chaste. But the fact that he's saying to Bess and Bess being her lady's maid, she would know this if he has been both late and early in her bedchamber. That's implying something else. Um, and then, yeah, there is that thing. It's like, actually, the things that he lists, which we assume he's being, um, you know, he's he's just, he's living in a fool's paradise and he's telling himself this, but actually one of them could be true. It could be that Delaville has paid best to actually, you know, say this. I, 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 I can't work it out. Like, what's, what's, who's telling the truth and who isn't? Um, there seem to be so many conflicting signals and I'm just, yeah, I'm really enjoying that. I'm also liking the overlap of, you know, this play is full of lots of people going, I, I don't want to tell you the thing. And, and you get the, the other person just going, be more plain. <laughs> How many early <laughs> modern plays would be improved by those lines being inserted somewhere in the text? Uh, anyway, uh, Lois then Stephen. Yeah. Um, this is a bit like uh, in A Woman Killed with Kindness, a scene where Nicholas tells Frankfurt uh, that uh, his wife and uh, the other man are having an affair. The difference is, of course, in that play, we, we know this already. Uh, mm. Frankfurt doesn't. Here, we, we don't know it. I mean, this is the first we've heard of it. And uh, there are reasons to doubt it, as, uh, uh, as Geraldine says. So uh, we're still left wondering about it. Uh, what's interesting, I think, in both cases is, is that it's servants who who know these things. And I think uh, it's something about the status of servants in, in these plays who can be in the room but not even noticed, you know, and who tend to know a great deal and, and be able to, to reveal it. 
Hmm. And and also uh, this goes back to the previous uh, uh, scene as well. Uh, the you know the importance of reputation in this society, not just of women but also of men. Uh, you know the 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 reputation of uh, of uh, you know who who who's worth the 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 oath that I will pay you your money later. Uh, hmm. You know uh, uh, as well as uh, a woman's reputation and the value of it placed in this scene. So there's all these interesting overlaps um thematic as well as uh, uh as elsewhere that i'm really liking this is so tightly done um and of course uh woman killed with kindness which is uh haywood as well but just 20 years earlier so mm. artists do repeat themselves and uh older artists do sometimes go back to earlier works and effectively sort of remix them it seems to be it does ha happen quite a lot um so it's interesting there uh stephen uh, just just a bit about about the clan monologue, really, because uh, um, you know the, there will be people in the audience drinking. You know, <laughs> there, there are these kind of food and drink franchises inside the theatre, according to Tiffany Stern, anyway. Um, and so uh, we and we have this kind of give and take thing. So we're sort of it's sort of like a a callback to the feel of the of the play earlier, I think, where we're we're taking, you know, very briefly, we probably can't forget it, but we're taken out of these increasingly kind of dangerous looking plot machinations. Somebody, somebody's actually being scripted to say, um, you know, do you open your mouth towards me and stuff like that? It's, it's all about the interaction, isn't it? And so we've, we've got this kind of in theatrical terms, you know, we're, we're back on that kind of um, roller coaster, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So to add to all the kind of, why are they saying this? Uh, you know, the plot plot is really thickening. Uh, at, at the same time, we've got we've got this going on too. So you know that which is another bit of good fellowship. I mean, literally, you know, toasting everybody, rattling off a list of names, which any kind of you know that's where that's where anybody can kind of just extend it and extend it uh, as far as they want, really, because it's in the middle, so it's not a queue. Uh, so I I just think it's. <laughs> I liked it so much when there was loads and loads of that, uh, you know, yesterday, and now it's kind of, you know, it's all getting real. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the, I don't, I don't think it's just kind of marking time, is it? It is part of what the play is doing mm. in terms of that kind of judo move. Yeah, I, and yeah, there's, uh, there was uh, th this thing that if you're going to destroy a world, it's always it's always important to uh, make sure everyone's uh, happy and enjoying themselves in the first uh, section of the play. So if you are going to you know turn it upside down, um, you know if you just start dark and continue, you know whereas whereas this play we were having so much it was all bouncing along last time, and now it's just getting really twisty and things. Uh, uh, briefly, Aliki and Lois. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, the clowns. Um personification into every possible container for alcohol into the member of a family. I mean, that was really lovely. Uh, it did occur to me as I was doing it that I don't know where he picked up the drink. So I also imagine him improvising, stealing this from somebody or possibly a member of the audience. And there were several points at which he had to drink and I didn't. But it looked like there were several points during that speech where he's quaffing. So there's an awful lot of business there too. Just I think you could give the drawer a reason to just keep coming on stage and walking off again with a new tray and he just keeps <laughs> grabbing one as he goes by. I mean, you could really make that run. Uh, Lois. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to make the point that uh, uh, although he could also he could be relating to the audience as well. I think this is primarily a monologue where he's having a conversation with uh, with various uh, tankards or whatever he's got there and uh, treating them like people. I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, I think this is one of the few clown scenes that actually would be funny to a modern audience as well. Mm. And we've had a clown scene with someone talking to 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 their cups before um, and having conversations with different cups, uh, although it's a very different dynamic to this one. Um, again, it's uh, good. You can't put a good bit of comic business down. Um, OK, we have one more scene to do this session. We need to crack on with it. Act four, scene one. We're into act four. Uh, Act 4, Scene 1, Enter Reynold. Now, impudence, but steal my face this once, although I ne'er blush after. <clears throat> Here's the house. Oh, who's within? What? No man to descend these innocent gates from knocking? Enter Master Rickert. 
Who's without there? One, sir, that ever wished your worship's health, and those few hours I can find time to pray on, I still remember it. Good mercy, Rignam. I love all those that wish it. You are the men. Lead merry lives, feast, revel, and carouse. You feel no tedious hours. Time plays with you. This is your golden age. It was. But now, sir, that gold is turned to worse than alchemy. It will not stand the test. Those days are past, and now only nights come on. Tell me, Rignob, is he returned from sea? Yes, to our grief already, but we fear hereafter it may prove to all our costs. Suspects thy master anything? Not yet, sir. Now, my request is that your worship, being so near a neighbor, therefore most disturbed, would not be the first to peach us. Take my word. <clears throat> With other neighbors, make what peace you can. I'll not be your accuser. Worshipful, sir. I shall be still your beadsman. Now, the business that I was sent about, uh, the old man, my master, claiming some interest in acquaintance past desires, might it be in no way troublesome to take free view of all your house within? View of my house? <clears throat> Why, tis not set to sail, nor bill upon the door. Look well upon it, view of my house? Then be not angry, sir. He, he in no way doth disable your estate uh, as for to buy, uh, as, as far to buy as you are loath to sell. Some alterations in his own he'd make, and hearing yours by workmen much commended, he would make that his precedent. What fancies should at this age possess him, knowing the cost that he should dream of building? Tis supposed he hath late found a wife out for his son. And now, sir, to have him near him, and the <clears throat> nearness too, without trouble, though beneath one roof, yet parted in two families, he would build and make what picked a perfect triangle, uh, quadrangle, proportioned just with yours, were you so pleased to make it his example. Willingly. I will but order some few things within, and then attend his coming. Exit Ricott. Most kind coxcomb. Great Alexander and Agathocles, Caesar and others have been famed, they say, and magnified for high facinerous deeds. Why claim not I an equal place with them? Or rather a precedent. These commanded their subjects and their servants. I, my master, and... Every way his equals, where I please, lead by the nose along. <laughs> they have placed their burdens on horses, mules, and camels. I, old men of strength and wit, load with my knavery. Uh, enter old Lionel. Till both their backs and brains ache. Yet, poor animals, they ne'er complain of weight. Oh, are you come, sir? I made what haste I could. And brought the warrant. See, here I have it. It is well done. But speak, runs it both without bail and main prize? It, it both carries form and power. And I shall warrant him. I have been yonder, sir. What says he? Like one that offers you free ingress, view and regress at your pleasure, as to his worthy landlord. Was that all? He spake to me that I would speak to you to speak unto your son, and then again to speak to him that he would speak to you, you would release his bargain. By no means. Men must advise before they part with land, not after to repent it. It is most just that such as hazard and disperse their stocks should take all gains and profits that accrue as well in sale of houses as in barter and, and traffic of all other merchandise. Enter yes. Master Rickert again, uh, walking before the gate. See, in acknowledgement of a tenant's duty, he attends you at the gate. Salute him, sir. My worthy friend. Now as I live, all my best thoughts and wishes impart with yours. In your so safe return, your servant tells me you have great desire to take survey of this my house within. Yeah, be it there no uh, trouble to you? None. Enter boldly, with as much freedom as it were your own. As it were mine? 
my Reynal, is it not? Lord, sir, that in extremity of grief you'll add unto vexation, see you not how sad he's on the sudden. Ah, I observe it. To part with that which he hath kept so long, especially his inheritance now, as you love goodness and honesty, torment him not with the least word of purchase. Counselled well, thou teachest me humanity. Will you enter, or shall I call a servant to conduct you through every room and chamber? Oh, no, by no means. I, I fear we are too much troublesome of ourselves. See what a goodly gait! Oh, it likes me well. What brave carved posts! Who knows, but here in time, sir, you may keep your shrievalty, and I be one of the sergeants. They, they are well carved. And cost me a good price, sir. Take your pleasure. I have business in the town. Exit Rickert. Poor man, I pity him. Hath not the heart to stay and see you come as were to take possession. Uh, look that way, sir. What goodly fair bay windows. Bays. Wondrous stately. And what a gallery! How costly sealed! What painting round and about! Every fresh object to good adds betterness! Terraced above, and, and how below supported! Do they please you? All things beyond opinion! Trust me, Reynold, I'll not forgo the bargain for more gain than half the price it cost me! If you would, I should not suffer you. Was not the money due to the usurer took upon good ground that proved well built upon? We were no fools that knew not what we did. I shall be satisfied. Please you to trust me with it. I'll see it discharged. Uh, yeah, he hath my promise. I'll do it myself. Never could son have better pleased a father than in this purchase. Yet hie thee instantly unto my house in the country. Give him notice of my arrival, and bid him with all speed post hither. Uh, ere I see that warrant served. That shall be thy first business. Uh, my soul is not at peace till face to face I approve his husbandry. Much commend his thrift. Now without pause be gone. But a short journey, for he's not far that I am sent to seek. I have got the start. The best part of the race is run already. What remains is small, and tire now, I should but forfeit all. Make haste, I do entreat thee. And exits with haste. So, the question we were asking early, how, earlier, how's he going to get away with this one? Well, he's <laughs> those plates are still spinning. Uh, he's, he's got one more plate up there. He's got Rick as a plate up there as well, so he's got to keep that one going. And, and that, off, off he goes. Um, yeah, much. I, I say it's, it's balancing the different tones very nicely. Sometimes you do we do plays where they shift from uh, themes. I mean, because the thing it hasn't got too dark a play. I mean, it, there, there's there's problems and there's tension and there's things and you know it could you know, but it's not it's not like someone's just been brutally murdered or anything. Um, you know, there are complications and emotional crises. Um, so generally, it still feels quite light. Um, and so it can shift to quite broad comedy um, quite nicely. Um, uh, and it dances around quite nicely. I mean, there's no mention of a, of a genre, um, I think. Uh, well, there was a, a yeah, tragic, tragic comedy. comedy. There was in the, to the reader, sorry. Uh, we didn't read that out loud last time, did we? So, uh, uh, yes, I forgot that bit. Um, but, yeah, that, that, it's, it's more comedy than tragedy so far. Um, you know, um, uh, Lynn. So... The the only the only criticism I would have so far is that um, the farce plot the the Lionel plot and the uh, the melodrama or not melodrama uh, the telenovela plot haven't intersected yet and I thought oh here's what's going to happen uh, Reynold is going to have is going to pretend to have purchased Wincott's or or Geraldine's house. Uh, and that's how the two plots are going to come together. But no, it's like this this completely different guy. So I'm getting a little impatient for the plots to overlap. But um, 
But other than that, yeah, it's it it just the the farce plot continues to be hugely entertaining, and the uh, and the love plot, um, the soap opera plot, uh, it continues to become more and more complicated and more precariously balanced. So that's something that they have in common is like the situation is is precarious. It could just blow up at any time in both the fun plot and the serious plot. Hmm. And and the serious plot has got, uh, you know, a good clown to keep it light um, in, in that sense. And yeah, I mean, I've not been really that bothered about the, the sort of <laughs> lack of interaction. I haven't felt it. Maybe you might in the production. Uh, I am asking the question now to myself, where was it? Where do you put the interval? Mm. Uh, which I'm not actually wholly sure because it, it flows along so nicely. And I do worry that the play might be damaged by placement of mm. interval. Um it does it does dance along very nicely um i i yeah and yeah the spinning the the spinning of reynold uh is 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 yeah is a real delight um i mean there there's there's a sort of question here you know uh, could could you sort of take one of the plots and do do a little production of that um mm. you know with with some i i don't know how well the gaps work between scenes. Um, I don't think I'd want to do that, but because the, the, they they both mesh, you know, even if they don't interact, they still mesh pleasingly. Um, but um, yeah, it's a question that maybe you know might be an option if you fancy doing it that way. Uh, Kyle and then Lois. I'm. I was surprised because last time the other play we read i came in in the middle and i could not get a purchase on anything that was happening but in this one it's every scene seems a bit contained every scene has something enjoyable and the tension that's building is just perfect like you're invested but it's not you know it just seems really nice i i, I really like this writing of this one mm. yeah I, I i think you say structurally that this is something that hayward's very good at is that you know we the, it it he fits this format actually very well uh if if we read the the right chunks sometimes if you're you, you we read a chunk and we we get halfway through one of the episodes uh it, it gets a bit annoying but um if you get the chunks right it actually flows really it, it makes the it works for these sessions some plays get absolutely discombobulated by these sessions because we we stop and start uh lois yeah this this way of writing might have to do with the fact that by by this time he had done some plays well particularly the four ages plays with i think two different acting companies who probably rehearsed completely separately and uh, uh you know you could do that if you have completely separate scenes where these actors never really have to meet uh, mm -hmm. i mean i wondered when we first got the reference to rycott whether this could possibly possibly be a misreading of Winnicott. And so uh, yeah. and it would be interesting to see whether you could, I, I don't really think you could because Winnicott couldn't possibly be made to look as much of a, uh, you know, a dupe as, as Rycott is in, in this. <laughs> it wouldn't make much sense of, you know, the whole relationship, but it's sort of tempting to, to do something like that. I mean, there's this funny sense of all these different houses being talked about and where, where the different rooms are and, uh, you know, old Geraldine's house, which has a fantastic garden and uh, is obviously probably the most sumptuous of the lot and uh, Winnicott's lovely house and then uh, uh, old Lionel's house, which is now pretty much a wreck and uh, sort of Airbnb, I mean, gone. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's bad Airbnb guests. Yeah, well, I mean, I have to say, you know, the, the, just the, that, that reference we were doing earlier, you know, the Suns had a massive party. Uh, I, I mean, you could update this actually very nicely as a staging. You could, you could, you know, set this as a, a very contemporary way. I, I don't know that you couldn't conflate the two characters. I don't know if plot-wise you can once we get to the final act. Um, but I, I don't think actually the 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 way he's being duped or, or the general niceness of it, because Rick basically just turns around and says... Uh, trouble with your dad is his dad is it uh he's, he's like he knows exactly what you know and he's going oh you had a party did you yeah yeah you had fun didn't you uh, and and so there's actually something quite he, he's congenial in a similar way and and he's not a wholly an idiot i mean he is duped but he's he, he's not like he's duped because he's he's fundamentally stupid isn't mm. it? uh but and you know if the other one is being duped in a in a different way I, i'm duping seems to be part of what this is yeah. about thematically so mm. it might be doable i say i don't know until the final session um yeah. whether it's a good idea even if it was structurally possible i don't know uh mm. alan 
Yeah, I mean, so far, I must admit, I looked at it and I thought Wincott and Rincott were actually the same person mm -hmm. um, because it could well work that way because you're obviously looking at near neighbours. And having looked at an awful lot of transcriptions of um, some of the dodgy print material from this period, nothing would surprise me. Um, but I think I've also worked out where you we logically put an interval, which is at the end of Act 2, beginning of Scene 3, mm. because you've got a change of locus. Um, and also, I think, uh, a gap in time. bit early in the text, though. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not far it's... short of halfway through. End of Act 2, Scene 3. Mm. Page 32 out of 79. So it's mm. not... not mm horrendously out yeah I, I never like a second half to be longer than the first mm. people always time the second <clears> half based on the first they always start looking at their watches once you reach the point in the first half that uh, the, the first half ended it's not impossible to do um and uh you know is doable uh and it does follow you know the ghost bit but yeah it's 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 there's there's, n there's never there's not a boom you, you want to mm thing um but if, if you know if there, there might be there might be options uh other thoughts are available okay we are approaching extra time so i'll go around the room for final thoughts i'll start with someone who was here last time a leaky uh, uh how are you finding the play overall so far that i'm still really enjoying it um i still think that almost everybody is basically decent and well-meaning even if they are out to well okay i i Probably not Reynold, um, and certainly not Delaville. But I think everybody else is kind of okay, and I like that, even when they're being made fun of. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying this. Well, the thing, the thing about uh, Delaville is, okay, probably not not a great guy, um, <laughs> but there is a motivation for what he's doing. He's not just be, he didn't just sort of do. Uh, you know, uh, uh, dob, dob the other chap in it um, yeah. without reason. Uh, I mean, the reason's less noble than it might have been. Um, it's it's certainly yeah, but um, you know, he's got motivation, and I like a motivation. You know, I like their reasons rather than just ha ha mu ha 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 twirl moustache. Uh, Stan, you were not here last time. How are you finding it? Yeah, so I, I, I'm I'm. I, I I think I say the same thing every time about Hayward. I always enjoy his work, and I always and I think that he's not amongst people who know who Hayward is. I mean, anybody who studies early modern doesn't think he's underrated, but I think the rest of the general public might not have heard, necessarily have heard of him. So yeah. I I feel like he should definitely be out there a lot more. Um, just a, a couple of notes. One is the one that people were talking about um, this being modernized, I guess, and I feel like. It's in the prologue, it's talking about like the no use of drum, trumpet, dumb show, combat, all of that. I feel like, yeah, it's because he's just using his words and his, I guess his intelligence to make a smart play. And I think it makes it very easy to stage, you know, basically any time, really. Mm. Um, the other item is one I think it was not read, the reader's notes. It's, this is a notable play because it's the one where he confirms he's had his his finger in 220 plays mm -hmm. and he actually says tragic comedy being one of mm -hmm. them you know be, being one of those 220 so you know whether he was exaggerating or not and shows how prolific a writer he was and how adept he was and really i guess at, at structuring his his works if the captives not the captives if sir thomas More does have his intervention with the clown work in it this is just it just shows how 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 well he knows how to use his clowns um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's interesting. Yeah, in in terms of modern revivals, I I always feel that people are reviving the wrong Haywards. Um, it, 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 you know, the, 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 they don't do the ones that I find the most satisfaction with, and I find it very <laughs> odd. Um, uh, uh, Lois, any final thoughts? Um, well, I don't know. I think I think this one, you know, as we've read it so far, would revive extremely well. I mean, even the all the stuff about the plague, you know, you shouldn't have touched that doorknob. I mean, you know, that that would uh, certainly still ring true. I think. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. depressingly so. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't be here tomorrow. Really, I do remember vaguely how it ends, but uh, I would just like to see how everybody reacts to it. Actually. Uh, 
yeah, that's probably all I better say that. And there's a there is a fairly obvious parallel that I, I refrain from drawing, and um, maybe somebody will pick it out tomorrow. Yes, we shall see. Um, uh, yeah, I, th there is always the the curse of the final session. Well, yeah. anyway, it's the resolution often often disappoints. So it will be very interesting to see because uh, you know this play does keep changing direction. So there's a lot of room for maneuver here for uh, how this where because anyone want to predict where they think this is going? <laughs> Feel free to to throw that in, uh, Kyle. Uh, not here last time. How how uh, how have you found it? I just really liked it because um, I was saying I felt like it really can't, it was so easy to follow, and it's just great writing. It seems I, I love the the gentleness that people have mentioned that seems to be here, and it seems very visual too. Um, I'm really excited to read the rest of it. I won't be here tomorrow, but uh, I'm excited about this play. It, it seems great. Uh, Alan, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I've just had a thought on modernising. Uh, you could put a large number 10 on the door of Lionel's house <laughs> um, and follow through. Probably not relevant to non-UK uh, people, but uh, given recent history and picking up on the plague reference, <laughs> you know, you could do all sorts of things with that game, couldn't you? Yeah, but that would make Rickot the Chancellor. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, your problem is, sir. Um, <laughs> he's too. I think a bit too. Too. Yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll move on. Um, Stephen, uh, any final thoughts? Uh, not not very much really to add. I mean, um, I think I think if you're doing it now, a huge amount of the tone would depend on how you decide to take Reynold. Um, how much how much of a kind of you know, improviser getting himself out of a jam he is, as opposed to a sort of more sinister figure. You know, I, I, I mean, uh, I'm still struck by the, the kind of the similarities to the vice, um, and the, and and these these vice and clown were kind of interchangeable terms for quite a long time um, after your actual vices and your actual moral plays stopped being written anyway. So. Um, I, that's all. That's all, really. It 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 it's, it seems to be the kind of pivot, and that the, the whole production will go one way or the other, depending on how you decide to do Reynold. Mm -hmm. uh, Emma, you uh, similarly have been here only only for this session. Uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, just here for this session, but I've kind of got drawn in straight away. It's such good writing. Um, I love the fact that they are kind of familiar characters, familiar setups, but then the plot itself is completely unpredictable. Um, I have no idea where it's going to go. And there are some really good um, duologues, two-handed scenes, um, in which it's it's very well crafted and each one of those seems to add another twist in the, in the particular plot. Um, and yeah, I am very much enjoying how the uh, Lionel, Reginald, uh, Raynal plot is just snowballing. <laughs> it's really fun. Mm. Uh, Lynn, any final thoughts? Oh, lots of them. Um, so uh, uh, while Stephen was talking, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, uh, Raynal is such a big part and such a, 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 a an important part in terms of the plot of the, the, the farce thread. But I don't think there's any, there's no question in my mind that he's, um, a Mosca character or a face character. He's 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 the clever servant from the classical tradition that basically wants to help out young Lionel. Young Lionel's a rake, but oh, I kind of like him, and I'm kind of we're you know I'm gonna like him. Um, and he's really at, honestly trying to get Lion, young Lionel out of a jam. He's not really in it for himself. I don't think he's a I don't think he's a bad person. Um, I, I I think again he's sort of well intentioned, like almost all the characters the the heavy preponderance of characters seem to be um in this play so yeah Haywood is he's underrated isn't he um and I think that's partly because even he in his most boastful moment says he's had a hand or a main finger he doesn't claim to be a sole author and we live in a post-romantic era world where we value individual genius and and we we tend to think of 
collaborative art as less than. Uh, <clears throat> so that makes, you know, our fantasies of authorship uh, are hard to apply to Haywood because we know he was a collaborator. Same goes for Middleton. And also, uh, I think it's 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 and it's a real quality of his writing that I really like. He uh, but goes against uh, that that kind a certain kind of popularity is the dialogue's all really good, but it's not necessarily quotable in the mm -hmm. way that that the other mm -hmm. more demonstrative poetry sometimes is. It's mm -hmm. dialogue. Um, yeah. It may be written in verse. But it's, re you know, and, yeah, and it is true. be more plain all the time. He's telling that's, the that's, story. That's true. You don't, you don't imagine it. I don't dare to probably uh, weigh in on this. You know, uh, published works of drama or other things often had little lines in italics that it expected readers to write down in their commonplace books. Mm. And you don't feel like there's a lot of that going on in this mm. text. So, but yeah, like other people are saying, the, uh, the individual scenes work well in terms of their flow, their... Um, their rhythm, their characterization, and the overall structure is so clever. I'm just really impressed with the dramaturgy uh, in, in all its aspects. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll, I see a few hands waving, so uh, uh, re responses. Uh, Dan, I think Lo Lois waved earlier as well. So Dan first. Um, not to dispute what you're saying, I agree with you, Lynn, um, but I will say I did during this chat, I mean, during our um, discussion, email or text the line about porpoises and metamorphoses. <laughs> To, yeah. um, our friend Agnès Lafont, the mythology expert, who was part of our group <laughs> for uh, Maze Metamorphosis. So there you go. Mm. Yes, the, 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 I do like a, a good rhyme, uh, depending on your definition of good. Uh, Lois? Uh, yeah, just about Reynold. I mean, he, he does, uh, I think there are a couple of indications that he's been robbing Lionel as well as robbing Lionel's father. I mean, that because he, he does have that rather interesting soliloquy where he says, you know, it's funny that they're all willing to trust me considering that I'm going to be in more trouble than any of you and I could just run out on you, but I'm not going to. And that's because uh, I think I should sort of make amends for the wrong I've done to the son, you know, by doing wrong to the father. I think that's the way he puts it. And that, that can only really mean that he's been, you know, profiting uh, by this. And that's why there's no money, even though at one point he said there was money. I mean, it's, it's all just vaguely suggested. And I think it's part of Haywood's style that although, and, and Reynold does call old Rycut a coxcomb, I think, after they've had their scene together. But it's also true that he's depicted, uh, you know, more sympathetically at times. And you, and, uh, and you always feel a certain sympathy for anybody who's just frantically trying to get out of a situation by telling a lie, which then forces him to tell another lie. And, oh, what a tangled web we weave. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I mean, it's, it's again with the relatively modern farce. Uh, you know, often the person you're supposed to be having sympathy with is, is usually an adulterer at the very least, um, or a multiple adulterer, or, or something which is not very worthy. So, the, 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 I, I think a certain level of roguery is around, uh, is allowed, mm. um, but you know, the heart's still in the right place uh, when it comes down to it. He'll find a way out. He'll find a way out. <laughs> Sarah, any final thoughts? Yes, I I am not quite so um, enthused about this play as I think everyone else. Uh, not because I haven't enjoyed today, because I really have, and I just I bow down to the greatness of Haywood actually, because I think he's this is brilliant. I don't remember I've read a few of his plays with this group now, and I don't remember any of them being as impressive as this um, c consistently. Um, uh, there are bits in others that I really enjoy. I really enjoyed the Fair Maid of the West and the Iron Age, um, but not all the way through. This so far <laughs> I've enjoyed all the way through, but that is what's making me a bit twitchy about how it's going to end because we had that whole weird um, thing with, with Scatha's punishment yesterday um, and she hasn't reappeared and she hasn't been um, drawn back into the B plot at all. And I'm like, well, what's happening there? Because that was actually quite a, that was quite a startling little scene. And yes, probably when it was written, it was just meant to be funny, but it seemed to me like there was a plot developing there with Blander and Scatha that hasn't really gone anywhere. And I'm like, I hope that does go somewhere. Um, and the other thing I'm really hoping is that if all this, all these shenanigans uh, with Delaville, if these turn out to be true, um, and if the wife has been, um, you know, 
having more than one suitor on her dance card, so to speak. Um, I really hope this does not turn into that other Haywood play um, mm. that you mentioned earlier that I was there for. Um, what's it called? Woman um, Killed with Kindness. Woman Killed with Kindness, yeah. I really hope this doesn't turn into a sort of, oh, I have been... I have been, you know, unfaithful and now I'm going to expire with grief because I wouldn't have, yesterday, I wouldn't have thought that that was the case uh, because the the speeches that we had from the wife were really rather good. She kind of came across as being quite an interesting character. But the fact that she's disappeared completely through this middle half and has just sort of become a plot device to be talked about, I that is that is throwing up some red flags for me, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, if she was going to be like a, a, a proper decent character, I would have expected to have heard from her in, in this middle section. And the fact that she hasn't appeared, I'm like, oh, no, she's going to end up like going, in, you know, she's either going to end up in a, she's either going to end up dead or in a nunnery, probably. And it's like, maybe it won't happen that way. I really, really hope it doesn't. <laughs> but I just... I feel that that might be a path that we're going down just because of um, the, the because he is so good at the characterization. The fact that he's chosen to leave out characters to characterize, if that makes sense, in this whole middle beefy section uh, just is 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 making me uh, a bit twitchy about it. So we'll see. I love what we've done today. I think it's a great play so far, but I'm just I'm holding fire with my enthusiasm till we get to the end. Yes, I mean, it's interesting, uh, just on, on the point about it. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Mistress uh, Win- Wincott uh, has, uh, what, you know, has said some dialogue in, the, in this sequence, but hasn't been very prominent. But I, I, I do think structurally it's quite important that she's not present because so much of this is about people saying things about other people. Um, and so structurally you can't. I, I can assure you she will say more later. Whether what you like it, I don't know, um, but you know it's it it does seem to be a struct uh, a structural decision um, rather than a fading out, as opposed to uh, yes, those characters were introduced to uh, quite prominently in the first se- session who have dwindled and I don't think fundamentally reappear. Um, so and we've had that okay, you know sometimes with plays. You know, something that started at Act One seemed like a good idea at the time. Can I fold it into the rest of the play? No, they just quietly disappear. Uh, and we may indeed also be suffering from uh, late onset disappearing clown disorder, uh, which we have had many a time uh, in plays because often the clown gets in the way of resolving the plot. Um, so that's happened. We've definitely had the diminishing of the clown. Um, we've had one nice little set piece, um, but we haven't had that much else uh, from the clown. Uh, the clown, the clowning or the farcing sort of been passed on to Reynold uh, for this. And, uh, in fact, it's been easy enough to double the two. Um, I don't think that's actually something you can do in the play, but um, we could do it for this session. Um, well, we've got one more session to go. It might all turn to so we shall see whether it does that next time uh, all that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading thank you very much everyone and goodbye Bye. private me no privates <laughs> <laughs>